the Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network presents Out of the Question, a podcast that looks behind some common questions and uncovers the question behind the question while providing real solutions from a biblical world and life view. Your co-hosts are Pastor Charles Roberts and Andrea Schwartz, a teacher and mentor. Hello, this is Andrea Schwartz welcoming you to this September 21st, 2018 episode of the Out of the Question podcast. I'm flying solo today due to the need to reschedule this interview to accommodate our guest, and the new time proved to interfere with an already scheduled appointment for my co-host, Pastor Charles Roberts. Well, we are coming up to election season in the U.S., and like most other times, we're told that this is one of the most important elections of our time. This is a reflection of the fact that too many people in our day look to politics as a means of salvation. R.J. Rush Dooney notes in his position paper on false religions that, quote, liberals and radicals see the answer to current inequities as more power to the state. And this solution is powerfully furthered by most of the media. The status solution is seen as morally correct so that all who challenge the growth of status power are somehow insensitive and morally wrong. In the minds of many, a link is being forged between true morality and the increasing powers of the state, unquote. Well, it's safe to say that salvation by politics is not just confined to liberals and radicals many professing Christian conservatives share similar sympathies. My guest today is Paul Doerr, someone I invited to talk about how Christians should approach their duty to weigh in on political matters and specifically how to approach ballot initiatives in terms of what they're actually selling and what they'll actually produce. So who is he? Well, Paul Doerr is the owner of Copperhead Consulting Services, and as I quote from their website, rollbacklocalgov.com, they provide services in political and financial matters designed to start rolling back the cost and spending patterns of local governments. Copperhead begins by helping clients build local political credibility through defeating local funding proposals, which are required by law to receive voter approval. Copperhead prepares local organizations to take political advantage of the wave of bankruptcies, municipal bond defaults, collapsing tax revenues, and loss of local and state subsidies to help establish local leadership in embracing the jurisdictions for civil government outlined in scripture. Thanks for joining me today, Paul, in the midst of your very busy personal and business life. Thank you, Andrea. It's, it's, a, it's a privilege to be here and to, to visit with you again and uh, uh, to, to hopefully we can inspire Christians across the nation to understand what, what Rush Dooney taught us. I was listening to a, a lecture, an audio again the other day about the, about the challenge between the, the anarchists and the, the conservatives. You know, the, one wants more status, one wants uh, ultimately the, the, the his his argument his point he was making was that that uh, they both uh, look to a different sovereignty other than God in all this stuff and uh, in their political involvement the anarchist makes man God and the Christian conservative makes the state God and uh, it is he's he's inspired and taught me a lot where I'm able now to teach this to people in nine states and there, there there's a hunger for this and I think honestly I think. Reconstructionists have have failed in not engaging much more uh, w- with these principles, much more um, uh, actively in their local communities. Because I I know the market's ripe. There, people are all over. When I get done in these in these issues, these campaigns, uh, these local fights, I often get this question from my clients and others: Where did you get this? Who teaches this kind of Christianity? What churches are there that where I can go to to get this? And I say, well. Start reading Rush Dooney, or, you know, so the, the, the hunger's there. It's real. Well, great. So personally, I think I first approached you about being a guest back in the spring when in California, the primary season was well in play. And I would get brochures in the mail 
discussing various ballot initiatives. And these things are big, a lot of small print, somebody's in favor of them, somebody's against them. You see the Secretary of State explaining what it is. But like most people, I'm like, I don't think I'm being given the full story here. So how do you, from a biblical world and life perspective, to figure out what these initiatives and these ballot proposals are really all about? Well, I start with the assumption that, the, or the presupposition that, is this an element of the civil magistrate's authority granted to them by God? If it is not, if they're involved in often its economic development or its infrastructure uh, aspects, many of which uh, the last hundred years since the Civil War have grossly expanded into areas that have no biblical warrant to exist. So I'll take the first look at it and say, is this is this a legitimate purpose under God's law for the, the government to be involved in this function? Almost every time the answer is no, it's not. The next thing I will then do is, and I, and I train my clients, is never trust the presuppositions behind the need. Always question, investigate, study, research, and challenge the opening presupposition. If you grant there's a certain need for an economic development or a, an, an infrastructure need of some kind, and you grant that the, the need is there, on the face of it, you're, all you're left is, is arguing is the degree of how much new debt and taxes and whatever that the local or state government uh, wants to incur then you've pretty well lost the fight uh, before you're getting started. So I, I then encourage clients, and they'll often hire me, to go back to the beginning with the government body and say, where did this come from? Who was involved? Uh, where is the, the consultant's uh, assessment on this need? We will go back and, and study and test the, the first presuppositions behind it. And almost every time, we'll find if it's a legitimate need, we'll find a very small legitimate need, and they will then from there exaggerate it into a much, much bigger, much larger proposal. Uh, the one thing the system never wants to do is start giving property tax relief back to uh, Christian citizens, businesses, and so forth, because once you taste relief, you start to say, wait a minute, why, why give them more the next time? They got by with this time, so they're they're always looking for more infrastructure or economic development programs or whatever they can create to simply continue to expand the servitude to the, to their taxes. So that's my, that's my presupposition. That's where I start is, is, is it biblical? Is it legitimate? If it's not, we should, we should resist it. Um, if it is, is it responsible? Is it ethical to the degree they're taking it? And those two questions, getting answers to those two, those two questions will, Often open up a whole new world to my clients, and they'll just they'll, they'll be they'll be amazed that there's it's it's, it's far beyond anything that the, the public relations campaign is telling us. Okay, to play devil's advocate, sort of, there will be people who say, well, first of all, I don't have the time to research all this, and maybe it's a bad idea to build more schools or to have another bond issue to you know create more jails or to improve and increase the amount of law enforcement officers that we have in the city. So if you just cold turkey say no to everything, won't civil government just stop? Uh, no. Um, most of, of those functions that are beyond their realm, the market could easily come in, uh, local initiatives, when people have large waves of their own earnings back in their own pockets, they will, they will look as Christians to form Christian schools, to, to establish toll roads. There's a whole lot of, of these functions that are illegitimate that uh, Christians and private associations can replace these with and do it far more efficiently, far more effectively, and with, with much better service. And, and again, even even the realm, I did a study in Polk County, Iowa, over a 10 or 12 year time period, and I saw the the level of of felony and, and civil uh, felony convictions going down and down and down. I saw the prison rate going up and up. The age of the average prisoner getting older and older. They're running out of youthful prisoners, and they're wanting more jails and more courthouses. And 
as they see these all this criminal conduct going down, they want more. And uh, in the end, they, they adjust the laws, they provide perverse incentives to arrest for less serious infractions, and uh, they're, they're unleashing a more tyrannical uh, police department far beyond its lawful authorities so that they can put more people in these prisons and build the whole status system. So that there's, there's perverse incentives for government to do all kinds of things that have the pretense of a, of a good purpose that all needs to be investigated carefully. So what you're really saying is no one's going to be able to spot this. They're not going to be able to understand the counterfeit unless they know the real. So if you don't know the limits on civil government as outlined in scripture, you're just as likely to think you're doing a good thing for there to be more law and order, for there to be more security, to get more crime off the streets, when if you don't even know the statistics to realize actually what the current facilities are, are just fine. The problem is they're not bringing in more revenues. And so these are fabrications to bring in more revenues. Is that correct? That's correct. And if there's nothing more we cover during this podcast than that point, I don't think there's anything could be more important that, that, has made, that God has blessed me and made me effective at what I do is starting with what the Bible li- prescribes for the limits of civil magistrates and taking that orientation into your analysis, your weighing of it, your, your, your preview, purviewing of it. Many, far too many Christians have, have taken the propaganda line of, of law and order, more law and order on the face of it and not looking at what are biblical crimes, what are, how, how are these, you know, the, the entire drug war, if you look at the 1980s, the Republicans gave us all this perverse uh, uh, drug education and, and mandatory sentencing guidelines, took away the discretion from judges. We have filled up prisons full of people uh, that, needed, that needed spiritual help, and they may need some medical help and so forth, but um, we've, we've put in a, an unbiblical punishment on the, the drugs. We've the government has created the problem with all their effective drug ed courses in the schools across America. They've create the mess. And if we don't start with a biblical premise by looking at what is their duty, what is their limitations, and look past their public relations and, and analyze carefully what it is they're doing, we get suckered over and over and over. And, and it's um, interesting to me because sometimes – People understand things in one situation, but not another. So, for example, there are many who homeschool who will say, you know, the government shouldn't tell me as a parent how I educate my child. And so they'll embrace an area of biblical jurisdiction. But if you don't go beyond that to recognize that God sets limits and boundaries for the church, for the state, for the individual, for families, for associations, you're very easily swayed into thinking well, this is the right way to approach this problem as opposed to knowing that the problem of drug use isn't because there aren't enough prisons. The problem with drug use has to do with people seeking out other gods other than the living and true God. That, uh, amen. That's all I can – absolutely the case, and I'm. it's ongoingly disappointing when – you see fellow Reformed and Presbyterian Christians, you see conservative evangelicals, you see these people buying this unbiblical pretext for the civil magistrate in so many realms, and, and uh, thus agreeing and consenting to increased servitude and slavery. They may have an objection here or there if, if it's more personal, but beyond that, they agree to much of it. And honestly, I've had tremendous opportunities When you take these biblical principles and engage a local government at the local level and applying these principles, not necessarily citing from the scriptures, but living out these principles in the engagement, I get a lot of people who've left the church, of unbelievers, of people who come to you and say, where does this come from? I said, God's law, here, here, and here, let me show you. And they're they're blown away. You know, it's like, well, Christians don't talk like this. And so we have, we have so many opportunities to evangelize. Uh, if we would apply God's law in all of our thinking in all of these areas, and uh, it, it's there, it's there to, to, to be taken. 
I'm reading a book right now uh, on a 50-year-old book by Jacques Ellul on propaganda, and it's it's really got me thinking how deeply impacted how, how much more insidious propaganda is. And I you, know, you always said, oh, propaganda is a lie. You know, they're just they're trying to lead everybody along. But I think Christendom has bought into so many of these things because they need propaganda as an alternative worldview, and they live in this ongoing tension and conflict with what God's law says. And so I, I, I try to open this up by just living it, by doing it at the local level and watch as people just get animated and excited. I got, maybe the last time we talked about this, I got a picture of a, of a young farmer in the upper Midwest sitting in his semi truck at a grain elevator. And he took a picture of reading Larceny in the Heart by Rush Dooney. Mm-hmm. And he knew none of this beforehand, but he, he responded to the principles and in time, he's starting to say, wait a minute, there's so much more behind all these economic models and government models that we, we've never been taught. So it's, it's there. It's, it's there if we, if we simply believe it and, and adhere to it and, and then uh, advocate for it at the local level. So are you saying that rather than being concerned who's going to be the next president of the United States or which judge is going to get the nod to go ahead and be a Supreme Court justice, that we should be much more interested in our local government, who sits in those positions and what sorts of things they're advocating? I was really big time in the 80s for all this presidential stuff and the Supreme Court stuff and on and on and on. And with all due respect, uh, I find this almost an utter and complete waste of time for Christians to engage. Because the first thing I tell people is, where do these state bureaucrats and these state politicians, some of which go on to become federal politicians and highest ranking rulers, and particularly the bureaucracy, where do they get their first introductions? Where do they start this, this career path they're on? It's almost always back at the local government level. The training for the, the, the statist salvific idea of government often starts at the local level. We can have a much greater impact on Christ's kingdom and, and pulling back on this idea of the government being your God and your savior and beginning to challenge people to stop taking their stolen money and build an economy and a culture and a civilization in your neighborhood, in your area, on God's law and the charity and the kindness and the love of, of, of Christ and his church at the local level and begin at least to start thinking about these things. The, the Fed in, the, in our states, that's all coming down. I mean, it, it, the, the debts, the, the, whole, the whole model is way, way past anything. I mean, it's just, it's just living on this hyperinflation model and it's, it's a global model. I think Christians could really see kingdom advancement as they would engage in the local level. There's so much, so much growth and progress and hope and seeing lives change and people wanting to come to the to, to Christ and and wanting to be taught God's law once they see you engage it at the local level. So long answer to your short question, absolutely. Yeah, I've seen that played out. When there was a local city council election, I made a point of calling up and seeing if I could talk to the candidates. And at that level, they're really willing to talk to you. You don't have to go through so many staffers. And I asked their position on abortion. And all of them said, well, that's a nonpartisan issue. And I'd say, well, I'm sorry, I don't think murder is a nonpartisan issue. Well, this is not something they say that we deal with at this level. I said, but we both know that this probably isn't going to be the last political situation you're in. So I want to know what it is you think. And then at that point, since obviously people would guess where I was coming from, the answer was, I believe in a woman's right to choose. And then the conversation was over. Right. And, and at, at that very, in fact, I'm researching a book, a sideline book for my right now on the, the history of the, the sex education movement and tying it back to Rush Dooney's teaching on education in general. And um, uh, you, you, Really, as, as uh, Alan Guttmacher, the former the president of Planned Parenthood and the Guttmacher Institute said, what, in, the, in the early to mid-70s, he said, what's going to secure abortion going forth in the future? And he said, sex ed. And, uh, it, and it, it, I call it classroom sex talk. And we have, I mean, 
it, it was Russ Dooney who, who woke me up and realized, you know, we've got to get out of their entire unbiblical educational system. And we homeschoolers have got to become more aggressive about this culture and, and detoxifying so much of it that comes at our kids from every direction. The whole mindset going back into the daycare centers, the way these children are being totally propagandized and totally educated into a sexualized culture, it's going to ensure the mass murder of children for, for years to come. We have to, we have to rebuild the, the entire model of raising children covenantally. And it was, it was, it was uh, Rush Dooney who taught us how to do that. And part of the deal is we're so used to instant gratification that our efforts need to produce. I mean, sometimes, to be honest with you, Paul, when my computer is slow and I'm not getting the click response that I want, I have to laugh and think back in the 80s when I first got my first computer, you know, I could have gone made a cup of coffee and come back by the time the response happened. And yet I get so impatient. Well, we have to have a long term view and the Bible really speaks generationally. So if I have to see it now, and that's the only thing that's worth it, not only is it very short-sighted, it's unbiblical. It's unbiblical, and it's, it's destructive. It, it feeds on uh, the, the entire propaganda system has coached us to insist and demand on instant gratification, have your, all of your needs met instantly. That, again, is something that, that through a lot of Russia's readings, I realized, my wife and I realized back in the 80s, we need to take a generational position. And it's going to be uh, laboring in the, in the fields uh, for decades, is building foundations and building foundations with our children, being open to as many children God would give us. He blessed us with 11. And I have, I have all of our children in some fashion Eight of the, of the 11 are married, and they're all contending to advance Christ's kingdom, and they're passing on the scriptures and the faith and this vision of generational covenantal blessing onto their children. We have 24th grandchild on the way. They're all being taught this. We have to have a generational vision. That said, I'm seeing things now that I assumed, my wife and I assumed years ago, that they would, the fruit would start to be yielded from our labors well after we were passed on to our reward. And, and I, I, I'm often, I'm seeing that God is moving the, the schedule along faster than I ever anticipated. And so it is that instant gratification, even in the political realm, Christians who raced in the 80s and want everything fixed quickly and politically with their Christian schools, all of it, that, that, that generational vision, absent that, we, we take the humanist secular world's shortcuts and we end up derailed and frustrated and homeschool families give up and uh, homeschool marriages are falling apart and, and you know all of this. And yes, we need, we need very much so to, to adopt a generational vision. And, and people have asked me you know, regarding your kids, how'd you do this? And I said, I took them along. My wife and I did, uh, we, we took them along you know, beyond teaching them the Word of God and the confessions and worshiping the living God and all the, all the, our primary duties, we took them along when they were kids on on street side, as I said, uh, to to engage the darkness. If it be a a perverted Christian college, an abortion clinic, uh, an unjust judge at a courthouse, and contended for the faith for Christ's uh, uh, crown rights and in his in his law in those realms and let, let your children grow up seeing mom and dad contend uh, against the, the, the darkness. It, it builds faith and character in those kids and that generational vision starts to grow. I like that you say contend for the faith rather than just be part of a protest because contending for the faith implies building and it implies a standard you're aspiring toward as opposed yep. to just saying, I don't like the status quo. And often when you're doing that, people say, well, then what solution do you have? And then the, it opens the door wide open for a, a, a biblical discussion on what the alternatives are and what, what we can do and how, and how God will bless this and so forth. And even in these local political initiatives, I have many, many people that start to rethink their whole support of, of public education, of, of um, government social welfare, a lot of these things. Uh, once, once you've demonstrated, you know, how illegitimate they are, 
And so uh, contending is is critical toward uh, God, God uses it so often to to waken up the spirit and the hearts of many, many other people. And um, we, we talk about solutions at that point. Right. It seems to me that it'd be a great civics project for a homeschooling family to take when the pamphlet comes with the initiatives and the candidates giving their point of view to start identifying their statements of purpose and vision and mission and evaluating them biblically. And for a lot of parents who didn't grow up knowing God's word and its applicability across the boards, this would be a great exercise for them as well. I, cu- I couldn't agree more. And, and as they consider it from God's word and then they, they start asking questions, what we call doing public records requests, uh, started getting their, the, the, the details behind the proposals and more doors open up. And at that point, uh, uh, I, uh, that's been my vision for 15 years is to have homeschool families come alongside it. We, we can't get them. Uh, honestly, we, most often we can't. When we get into a local contest, uh, we'll call up the homeschool leaders and we'll ask them, you know, can their, can their kids help us with yard signs? Can they uh, go to the courthouse and do a, a, a request of some things for us? Can they, and uh, most homeschoolers will just, they just cut and run, and it's, it's sad because there's so much. I, I, I took our youngest son, he's 15, when he was 13. He came along when we audited a post-election uh, voter rosters in a county in Minnesota, and he got to sit there as we had the updated voters list from the Secretary of State out of St. Paul. Out of St. Paul. We're looking at the updated list, and we're looking at the manual rosters, and we're going through them, and we're finding like 900 voters that are off that said they voted that didn't vote or that did vote and they didn't vote. This is just one little exercise. We take them along and he gets to sit there at, at the age of 13 with his own eyes and say, well, that says they voted. And the secretary of state's list right here says they did not vote and back and forth like that. And we had, we had to have the whole County redo the, the, the recount and everything else. And that, that just in our child's mind, that's just one little exercise, but he got to realize, you know, when the government, as God speaks and says, thus saith, and this is true and a fact and so forth, it may not be at all. It may be totally off. And, uh, and that's, again, this one little exercise, but there's so much that homeschool families could do at the local level, uh, applying the, the, the law of God, the scripture, uh, and, then, and then using that as they, as they engage locally. And uh, the, the, fu- the fun one I like to do is to get homeschool kids to go with a video camera and, and video record a, a public school board. Instead of being afraid of the public school, going on the going on the offense and recording them often when they're up to no good, they realize we got a homeschool kid here holding us accountable with a video camera. <laughs> uh, that, that that's that's I mean there's the, the possibilities are endless. We just won't we just won't begin to consider it. I think it's because people have a gross misunderstanding in many churches when the scripture says that the gates of hell won't prevail. They have this bunkered down mentality that says, if we're just safe in this little room, they can't come and get us, as opposed to what you're saying is, oh, we're not worried about them coming and getting us. We're going after them. I've got 30 years of doing this. And many times, humanly speaking, you're, you're uh, say, very, very frightened about what you're up against. And over and over and over again, I've seen God have his victory. I've seen the tyrants, the darkness step back. I've seen them. I've seen federal judges say, who are you people? Where is this coming from? I've, I've watched victory upon victory. I've seen people want to come to church. Where is this coming from? We, if I'm, I'm post mill and I believe, I believe Psalm 110 and 1 Corinthians 15, these things are real. Christ's kingdom is is it will is going forward, and we have we have absolutely bought into this bunker mentality, and we have no idea what how often what a, a wet brown paper bag most of these government entities are. It's it's bluff and PR and lies, and they've lived it and got away with it. They're not they're just not used to us being on the offense at all. In fact, I got a little story and. I'll often call up a government agency and say, I'm, I'm a consultant working on this upcoming referendum. It's on the, 
on the ballot and uh and I'll, I'll mention the county or the school you know and they've never heard of a consultant working for the taxpayers so they assume that i'm a consultant working for this government jurisdiction trying to help pass it so i'll ask for certain records and all this sort of stuff and sometimes these public records fees can be 300 500 a thousand dollars and they'll say oh you work on this upcoming referendum and in a so-and-so county or so-and-so school district and i'll say yes yes i am i'm consulting on, on this whole on this campaign i said okay we'll just give them to you for free don't, don't worry <laughs> about paying us that's okay and i say well thank you very much that's very kind and that i never tell them they, uh, they find out a week later when it's in the media that the that the local christian taxpayers have hired a consultant to push against them <laughs> and the government some other government agency just gave me all these records for nothing where they yeah. would have charged us the full amount otherwise so right. they're not, none of the system is used to Christians being on the offense at the local level. And I'm here to testify that there's all kinds of opportunities for kingdom growth. I mean, it goes back to if God be for you, who could be against you? Amen. And one of my favorite portions of scripture, and when I was teaching it to my children, I sort of put it into the vernacular. Here was a godly man about to be put to death because he stood against a statist. And God created a situation where the king had insomnia and he wanted a bedtime story and the bedtime story <laughs> saved the life of the person who the status was about to kill. And guess yeah. what? The status and his sons got to use those beautiful gallows that he created. Yep. Yep. Where I've, where I've so often seen and, and have sometimes personally experienced is, is even the broken vessels like Samson, who were over and over were told in, in Judges 15 that, that he's of God, he's of God, he's of God. And, and he's, he's the, kind of the first step of deliverance for God's people uh, that, that comes in, in David and so forth later. But he's, when he's standing against the status and the tyrants, God's people turn him over to them to the Philistines and it's like uh, we're, this is so alien to to Christianity to, to, to God's people and their and there's their idolatrous view of the state is so intense that it takes a while for sometimes to have them experience it before they realize this is true you saw you saw the tyrants back up and you'll get you get a lot of attacks from other Christians you know you're you're Roman 13 you're this or that you know they'll throw at you and we'll say where, how, but um, they they don't want to they don't want to believe that the, Christ, the the spirit of God and, and the the word of God has given us this kind of power, not in ourselves at all, but but uh, the power of, of the living God in us. It's it's real, and I it's all I can do is proclaim it and model it to those you know around me and and um, and watch as others grab it and go. If you don't mind, you don't need to give the whole backstory, but for our listeners, Paul and I have talked before, and he is always entertaining with some of his stories. Would you mind sharing, not like I said, the backstory, but the details of the time you were in a meeting with some governmental bureaucrats, and they were curious about how many children you had, because you had some of your sons <laughs> with you, and they wanted to know how many more like this you had. I love that story. I, 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 I'll say this. With, without the backstory, it was very high-level federal officials uh, who had us in Washington, D.C., and it, we'll leave it at that. They were fishing. They were trying everything they could to uh, – we, we were we were innocent of anything they suspected, but they, you know, when you're dealing with federal officials, they'll try to make you uh, be guilty. And um, at one point during our being interviewed, uh, the, the – the one official, I made some comment by how this the one the one son wasn't talking to me as much, and he wanted to. He asked. He said, "Well, he, he, I know what he was trying to do. He was trying to imply that my son did something inappropriate, and he was guilty of something, and that wasn't the case at all. And there was a very legitimate reason. But he asked me. He said, "So how come he wasn't calling us?" So I I explained it, and then I said, "But I tell you, in the end, I said I really don't. Uh, it didn't bother me that I didn't hear from him for two or three months." And he said, well, "Why is that?" And I said, "Because." With ten with ten other siblings calling, asking for for money, advice, uh, educational help, counseling, whatever else, I said, when one of them doesn't call, I said it kind of gives you a break. You know, I, 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 you know, Dad could use use a break for a while. And these four federal officials looked at me and said, "How many children?" And I said, uh, 11. 
and they said, um, and they'd already talked to two of my sons, and they said, two of them like this? And I said, well, no, they're the, they're the runts of the bunch. I got big kids and tall kids. And I said, they're the runts of the bunch. I said, um, I said they're, they're the short ones. The rest of them are taller. I was kind of making light of the whole thing. And they said, oh, my goodness, you have 11 children? And the one senior officer there, the federal government, looked at me and said, how many women? <laughs> and I looked at her. I looked at her, held my finger up, held one finger up, said, my high school sweetheart. Oh, my. Oh, my. Well, the one of them said, you have a football team. I said, no, we're homeschooled. I said, we got other, other contests far more important than football games that, that our family engages in. This, if, if I could tell, the, uh, it's best I don't tell the details, but if, if people understood, uh, the one looked at me and said, I got five kids bringing two marriages together. And he said, that's a handful. And he said, I don't know how you do this. Later, an advisor was in the room during this interview with us, turned to my sons and said, I've just met a, a group of senior federal government officials who had their first introduction to a patriarch. So they've never seen anything like this before. I told our advisor, I said, knock it off. I said, I'm just in there to not, not let anybody get railroaded and, and uh, uh, contend for Christ and his law. And he said, no. He said, with all due respect, he said it was like Moses was in the room. <laughs> and uh, I, I laughed and I said, well, look, and I came home and told a bunch of people, I said, Christ's crown rights are real. What, you, this is, uh, we have to learn to contend because I've seen federal and state officials and I've seen you know, the tax men, I've seen the whole system uh, yield. If we're walking true to Christ in obedience to his law, striving in every area of our life, they, when they see the, the realness of it, they, they respect it. And uh, they quickly realize they're dealing with something different than they normally do with a typical evangelical. So that's a truncated version of the story. I suppose if anybody is really interested, they could pursue finding out from you if you wanted to share it. But I, I wanted you to bring it up because even in the course of doing your job or defending the job you had done or whatever the circumstance was, that you're salt and light and people take notice. And so rather than being afraid of rocking the boat, let's be glad that we're in the boat with Christ and that we're safe so long as we stay on his agenda and that our purposes reflect his purposes. Amen. And, and um, we're, we're, they'll, they'll throw traps at you all the time. And I, I mean, my, my sons can be quick to tell that it'll, it'll, it'll be money, it'll be power, it'll be access, it'll be women, it'll be, as you're contending in the system, when they see that you're, there's something different, that, that, that the, living, the living Christ is in these people, then the next, the next step is to try to seduce and try to, to take you out. And once, once that fails, they have a formal enemy and they know it. And, uh, and at the same time, that's when God starts to raise up the remnant and, the, and even the stones come forth and say, how can we get in this? Who, who are you? Where, where did you get this from? And uh, there, there's, there's so many possibilities. And we just sit on the sidelines. Too often, too many. So, Paul, if so, somebody wanted to find out more about you, they could go to rollbacklocalgov.com. Okay. Uh, they fill out the contact form, and I, I respond usually within, a, within an hour. Okay. So you're saying that people have ways in which either to bring you into their locale for a particular initiative or ballot fight that's coming up, but do you also have good resources for them to educate themselves on how to be little Paul doors wherever they happen to live? I would recommend they spend a large amount of time on my site. I'll be honest, I don't, I haven't got the professionals I needed to, to get the site more uh, eye-friendly and organized, but just go down the left side of my page and click and read, because many people who contact me say, you've answered so many questions and things I never knew about how it works. I needed to talk to you. We need to get you in our community. So yes, just spend some time on the site, read the articles get familiar, get engaged. And I have a lot of links and a lot of things on there for further reading. I, I, I linked to, to Cal Seedon a couple times in there. And so there's, there's uh, much on there that they can, before they even start to look into the local level, what the drawback is for a lot of people is that, that this takes work and sacrifice. 
it's just, it's just going, there's no, there's no shortcut. There's no quick, uh, quick vote. Uh, but I've seen the, the, the Christians in nine states that I work in that engage this and stay at this steadfast, the long-term vision. I've seen them start to turn out the tyrants. I've seen them start to get people seeking their advice and counsel. There's, there's much, much there, but it's, it's, there, there is no quick, we're back to your, to the prior point. There's, there's no immediate gratification. There's work. Yeah. And, um, and so spend some time there, follow the links. And uh, at that point, after they spend some time, they can certainly contact me. And if they got further questions, I can route them to all kinds of other resources. Okay, so repeat the name of the website. Rollbacklocalgov.com. R-O-L-L-B-A-C-K-L-O-C-A-L-G-O-V.com. Rollbacklocalgov.com. All righty. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate you taking the time. Um, listeners aren't going to realize the, the dad stuff he had to do today um, in order to retrieve a son who is helping um, with the relief effort in North Carolina from hurricanes. And the choice was make our original time or leave his son at a truck stop. And we both opted <laughs> to go pick up his son. <laughs> Thank you for your, your, your patience and flexibility. And, and uh, we got him home and, and uh, quite the stories to tell, but God be praised that you know, many people were helped. So. All right. Very good. Thank you, listeners. Join us again next time for another edition of the Out of the Question podcast. Thanks for listening to Out of the Question. For more information on this and other topics, visit Kingdom Driven Family. Dot com. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows, or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce, including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit reconstructionistradio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His Kingdom.